This segment of our course on roller contact bearings deals with identification and selection of bearings. In other words, once you have removed the bearing and found that it must be replaced, you will need to identify it and select a replacement. The first step is to identify the bearing. The bearing identification is usually engraved on the outer race of a bearing, like this. It will consist of the name of the bearing manufacturer or manufacturer's trademark, as shown here. The other part of the identification consists of a combination of letters and numbers. This combination is a code devised by the manufacturer. It specifies the size, type, and special features of the bearing. You will soon find that each manufacturer has his own code system. Therefore, the identification of the various bearings is not standardized. By way of example, here are two bearings which are interchangeable. In other words, they are the same size and type and have the same features. As you can see, they're made by different manufacturers. And it's also obvious that the identification code is not the same. Each manufacturer has his own code. Since this is true, bearing manuals have been published. This manual, and others like it, have cross-indexed the bearing manufacturers and the bearings they make. The manual enables you to locate the specifications for nearly any bearing in common use. And more important, it lists bearings made by other manufacturers that are interchangeable with the bearing you are trying to identify. We won't explain exactly how the manual is used, since there are explicit instructions for use included in the front of the book. However, we will give you a general idea. First, you will need to locate the manufacturer's name or trademark on the bearing race, as shown here. In most cases, the name will be separated from the combination of letters and numbers used in the identification code. However, this is not always true. As you can see, the bearing manufacturer's name and code on this bearing are positioned quite close to each other. Be very careful not to confuse the manufacturer's name with part of the code. Check the entire face of the bearing very carefully for all identification. Once you have located the manufacturer's name, find it in the index of the bearing manual. The manual will have a complete section devoted to each manufacturer, as shown here. The next step will be to find the bearing code number under the manufacturer's heading. As we told you earlier, this is the manufacturer's code for this particular bearing. You will need to find the number in the section you have just located. Once you find the number, the index will refer to a specific page in the manual. Turn to that page. After you have turned to the page, Check the page title to be sure that it refers to the bearing you are working with. If in doubt, check the cutaway sketch on the page as the workman is now doing. There will sometimes also be a short paragraph on the page giving a brief description of the bearing. Check the description against your bearing. Once you are satisfied that you have the right page, you are ready to complete your cross-indexing. The chart on each page will normally be divided into two basic parts. One part will have several columns of manufacturers. Find the column which bears the name of the manufacturer of your bearing. Then locate the bearing code number in that column. From this point on, all you have to do is read on a line to the right or left of the number. You will find other bearing code numbers in columns under different manufacturers. All of these bearings on the same line as yours 
should be interchangeable with your bearing. In other words, if you can't get an identical replacement of your bearing from the same manufacturer, then you can obtain a replacement from one of the other manufacturers listed. In addition to the interchangeable bearings listed, the chart contains the basic dimensions of your bearing. It usually will contain the bore, outside diameter, and width in both inches and millimeters. Here is one other basic problem you could encounter when cross-indexing your bearing. As you can see, this bearing has a suffix and prefix made up of several letters. These letters usually refer to some special feature of the bearing, such as shields, seals, snap rings, or even the degree of precision of the bearing. In some cases, it may be necessary to refer to the special section under the manufacturer of the bearing in the index. In most cases, the section would be called symbols. By turning to the section on symbols, you could then interpret the suffix and prefix and find out what they stand for. This also is part of the identification procedure. Usually there will be a set procedure that you must follow in identification and selection of a replacement bearing. This procedure will be dictated by your plant. In many of the larger plants, storehouse catalogs are published that contain a listing of the replacement bearings kept on hand. If this is true at your plant, you would then attempt to locate the bearing you're working with under the bearing section in your storehouse catalog. If you are unable to locate it, you will need to refer to a bearing manual, as we just showed you, and find a substitute or interchangeable bearing that is listed in your catalog. If you are still unable to find a replacement, tell your supervisor what the problem is, and he will take care of the special ordering that will be required. Once you have received your replacement bearing, check the manufacturer and identification number to be sure that the bearing meets your requirements. This is especially important in the case of a substitute or interchangeable bearing. When checking the identification, pay special attention to the precision with which the bearing was manufactured. The degree of precision is measured with A, B, E, C numbers on ball bearings and R, B, E, C numbers on roller bearings. The degree of precision with which the bearing is made is measured on a scale of five numbers, one, three, five, seven, and nine. The higher the ABEC or RBEC number, the greater the degree of precision. In short, the higher the number, the smaller the tolerance in the bearing. Bearings with the number one are classified as standard fit bearings. You will be working with this type in most cases. Bearings with high numbers are called super precision or ultra precision bearings. These bearings have an extremely low tolerance and a very great degree of accuracy. Since they are manufactured with super precision, they must also be fit with special care. This means that bearings with high ABEC or RBEC numbers will be more difficult to install. We suggest that you check with your supervisor before attempting one of these installations. With the standard bearings, simply refer to reference A in your workbook. We'll be back to show you the installation of the bearing after you complete exercise number five in your workbook. This segment of our course deals with the installation of new bearings in the single-stage centrifugal pump we dismantled earlier. As you remember, 
The bearing housing and shaft fits were carefully cleaned and measured and are ready for the installation of the new bearings. Our first step is to clamp the shaft in a vise equipped with protective jaws. The shaft should be in a horizontal position with the lock washer tab slot on the top, like this. To install the first two bearings, the angular contact bearings in a duplex mounting, you will need to heat them in a hot oil bath or induction heater. The bearings are usually heated to approximately 175 degrees Fahrenheit. This will expand them enough so that they will slide onto the shaft easily. The workman is now checking the bearing temperature with a pyrometer. Once they're heated, slide them quickly into position, like this, against the shaft shoulder. Make sure the bearings are in the correct position relative to each other. In this particular case, back to back. Now install the lock washer and lock nut on the shaft, tightening the nut firmly against the bearings. We will not fasten the lock washer at this point, since we will be removing the lock nut and lock washer in a few minutes after the bearings cool. The only reason we install them now is to hold the bearings in place while they cool. Don't forget to place a clean protective cover over the bearings to prevent any dirt or other contaminant from getting on them while they cool. The cover could be the bearing package or a clean, lint-free cloth. While those bearings are cooling, heat the single-row radial bearing to the desired temperature, the same as you did a moment ago with the other bearings. Slide it quickly onto the shaft, seating it against the shoulder on the shaft. Once the bearings have cooled, remove the protective covers and the lock washer and lock nut. As the bearings cooled on the shaft, they tended to shrink away from the shaft shoulder and even away from each other. This means that they are no longer seated tightly against each other or against the shoulder. To remedy this, we will tap them into place with a specially designed punch. As you can see, the punch is shaped to fit against the inner race of the bearings without causing any damage. It is made of mild steel, a metal that will mushroom slightly during use, but will not chip or flake, resulting in damage to the bearings. However, if your punch does begin to mushroom, it must be reshaped. Be very careful to remove tiny fragments of metal from the tip of your punch before using. The workman is tapping the bearings into place very carefully, not hitting the punch too hard. As you can see, he has it positioned against the inner race of the bearings. He taps first on one side of the bearing, then on the other. This procedure prevents cocking of the bearing that could damage it. You would then repeat the procedure with the radial bearing, tapping it firmly into place against the shaft shoulder. Once the bearings are seated in place, he reinstalls the lock washer and lock nut on the shaft and tightens them securely. He then fastens the lock nut in place with the lock washer by bending the tab into the slot, like this. The next step is to remove the shaft from the vise. Then insert it into the bearing housing and seat it properly. The workman now reinstalls the bearing cover on the bearing housing using the same thickness gasket as the one he removed earlier. He tightens the cap screws on the cover using the crossover method to avoid cocking or tilting the cover. Once the cover is secured, check the total lateral movement of the shaft with a dial indicator. In other words, Mount a dial indicator with the foot against the end of the shaft like this, 
Then move the shaft back and forth to find out the total lateral or axial movement. Check your reading against the manufacturer's specifications. If it does not meet specifications, it may be necessary to change this gasket. A thinner gasket would decrease the total axial movement of the shaft, while a thick gasket would allow more end play. Once the lateral movement is set, install the outboard deflector on the shaft. Then reinstall the coupling on the shaft. The only remaining task is to reassemble the pump itself, which does not concern us in this training module. Again, let us remind you that the installation of the bearings that you just saw may vary somewhat from one pump to another. However, the methods and procedures shown will be much the same in most cases. If you understand the procedure we have shown you, you'll have little difficulty adapting to other pumps. Now that you've nearly completed our course on rolling contact bearings, it should be very apparent that these are precision bearings, manufactured to very close tolerances. Since they are precision bearings, it is extremely important that you handle them with care. Follow prescribed procedures during installation with special attention to the manufacturer's specifications. If you follow the specifications set forth by the manufacturer and adhere closely to the removal and installation procedures we showed you, you'll find that bearings will make your job run much smoother. However, Carelessness in bearing work can result in disaster. As you now know, there is a tremendous variety of bearings in use throughout industry, all designed to be used in certain applications. There are also some differences from one manufacturer to another, both in design and in identification. Your main concern will be to become familiar with the systems of identification so that you can interchange them when necessary. Without bearings, the wheels of industry would grind to a halt. Since machines of all types have moving parts and bearings between those moving parts and the fixed parts that hold them, by using bearings, industry accomplishes the most work with the least effort. It's up to you to keep the bearings at your plant in top operating condition at all times because without bearings, your plant could not operate. We have some questions for you now in exercise number six in your workbook.